Some of Asia's major rivers radiate out from the Mount Kailash area, which may help explain why the mountain has been called the navel of the world. The most sacred mountain in Tibet, Mount Kailash, which has never been climbed, is sacred to the Tibetan people, Buddhists, Hindus, and Jains. The walk around the mountain is 52 kilometers and takes a leisurely three or four days. The only problem is that the trek begins in Darchan at 4,600 meters above sea level, and at the pass, the trail reaches 5,500 meters. To put it in a word, the big problem is the lack of oxygen. Nevertheless, breathing aside, it is an enriching and spiritually beneficial trip which pilgrims have enjoyed for at least a millennium. When I walked around the mountain in 2015, I carried a GoPro camera mounted on a gimbal. Tourists can go there by traveling overland from Kathmandu in Nepal or by flying into Lhasa, the administrative capital of Tibet, and going overland from there. Twice, I visited Mount Kailash by traveling up from Nepal, but in 2015, I flew into Lhasa. In the last few decades, Lhasa has become a modern and bustling city of about a half a million people. The most famous spot in Lhasa is, of course, the Botala Palace, the ancient home of the Dalai Lama. You can tour the Botala, or you can join the Tibetans as they walk around it, occasionally passing lines of prayer wheels like these. A thousand meters east of the Botala is the most sacred temple in Tibet, the Jokong, which dates from 640 AD. It is so holy that many pilgrims like to prostrate themselves in front of it, like you see this woman doing. Completing 100,000 full prostrations is considered a purification exercise. In front of the Jokong is a large square, and beyond that, the Potala Palace is clearly visible. Pilgrims also like to walk around the Jokong Temple in an area that is jammed with shops for tourists and pilgrims. Indeed, Tibetans like to walk clockwise around all of their holy sites. They call it Kora. Most people spend two or three nights in Lhasa to acclimatize themselves to the thin air before beginning the three-day trip to Mount Kailash. Accommodation along the way can range from Western-style comfort to simple Tibetan guest houses. Finding vegetarian food is not a problem, and these days, most places have Wi-Fi. When I first visited Tibet, much of the road to Mount Kailash was not paved, and indeed, for parts of it, it seemed as if there was no road at all, and that the driver was simply aiming for some distant landmark. In those days, whenever we stopped, curious people would appear to have a look at the foreigners. Now, however, the road is paved the entire way, so traveling to Mount Kailash is not much different 
from traveling on a well-maintained highway anywhere in the world. After the three-day drive, one finally reaches the village of Darchen, the place where the walk around the mountain begins and ends. These days, Darchen has paved streets, comfortable accommodation, hot showers, and supermarkets. After a breakfast of eggs and toast, my walk began at a leisurely 8.30. Leaving the village, one passes the first of many piles of money stones that can be found around the mountain. I'm told that every stone says the same thing, Om Mani Padme Hum, which is the sacred mantra of Tibet. After about an hour of walking, I finally unpacked my camera. And now, the core has begun. It's going to be another 30 minutes or so before we get our first sighting of Mount Kailash, but it feels good to begin the walk around the sacred mountain. So the idea is that you get purified by walking around Mount Kailash, reborn, we can say. And this little archway you see up here, you're supposed to walk through. And as you do, you cut a piece of hair or something to symbolize leaving your past behind because you're going to be reborn. Well, that's all very good. Let's hope it actually works. So this is one of my favorite places on the whole Kora, and uh, all the more beautiful because of the snow. I just met some people, and uh, they, they turned back. They said they couldn't go on because of snow at the pass. Well, guess what? That is not going to stop me or the people I'm with. The, the a yak can walk in about 10 inches, you know, a third of a meter of snow, and you just put your feet wherever the yak has walked, and you're perfectly fine. So I anticipate no problems. Let's just have a final look here.
these yaks, by the way, I believe are carrying my gear. The word is that they're young yaks, so uh, a little bit hard to manage. But uh, it sure beats carrying the stuff. Here we have a bunch of prayer flags and looking up we can see Mount Kailash thoroughly covered with clouds. It's now quarter to two in the afternoon. Keep walking on here through the uh, lovely Garden of Eden with rocks. lunch was instant noodles. If you're hungry enough, it's not too bad. At 4.30 finally arrived at the monastery and looking around there we can see Mount Kailash. And tomorrow we'll just take a hike up uh, to the glacier and have a look to the plains in Cyrus. This was as high in my three trips up the mountain I had ever climbed. At this height, as the sun warmed the snow and rocks, occasionally I would hear rock slides. It was a little scary. There is a stream flowing just here. Water from that stream is, of course, completely pure and is considered to have healing properties. Just then, one of my fellow travelers, Ed Sobin, saw me and took this picture. Zooming in, you can see how the wind from the south is pushing snow off the top of the mountain. Then Ed, who is a much better climber than I am, approached me and urged me to keep going so leaving my gear behind, we walked further up the mountain, almost as high as one could go without climbing gear. Here I am, touching my head to the side of the mountain. As I did, suddenly and completely unexpectedly, a river of tears poured out of my eyes. It may sound strange, but clearly, to me, the mountain was touching me very deeply. 
Later that afternoon, a professional photographer who happened to be with us, Pierre Racine, took this picture. Here you can see why the top of the mountain is called the Hood of Shiva. This is the past day and the longest day. So we walk up to the pass, boulder jump down, stop at a tea house, and then walk for a few miles to a temple that supposedly was started a thousand years ago by Milarepa. Beautiful morning. So this is it for the fantastic views of the north face of Mount Kailash. So there's the monastery and the guest house that I slept in last night. You can see the way that I began the walk up to the north face and now we're coming up to a magnificent view of the east face and you get some idea as to the pyramid quality of this mountain. In another of Pierre's pictures you can clearly see the north face and just to the left of it the east face. And zooming in, we can see that today the wind is blowing from the southwest. Before the east face disappears, I thought I'd take another shot here. So you can kind of get the feeling of where the pass is a few hours ahead here. Okay, starting to warm up here. Peeled off a few layers. I thought Kailash was going to disappear you can still see it and you can see some Tibetan pilgrims coming up and uh, wearing all of their finery. And uh, there's Kailash. It's gonna disappear though, I guarantee you, after we go over this trail. So we're going over this saddle and uh, this is the pass. So this is the last really tough part. It's now just 12 o'clock and uh, so still lots of time. There you can see some ice up there in Glacier. Okay. It took me another hour and a half to reach the top of the pass. It's not that the path is particularly steep. The problem is that as you approach the 5,500 meter or 18,200 foot pass, there is just half as much oxygen as there is at sea level. As I reached the top of the pass, I was a little drunk with altitude sickness and exhaustion as I turned on the camera and tried to think of something profound to say. So here we are at the pass. You know you're at the pass because there's wall-to-wall -wall prayer flags and people relaxing in a moment of celebration, eating, 
sharing food. So it's quite a hike up here. And now it's about 45 minutes down here and then it's it's a level stretch. In theory, this is a place of rebirth, a place where one begins one's life again. So we certainly have our hopes. And uh, let me tell you, it's a little bit tiring. So about 45 minutes downhill and everything will level out. After 40 minutes of coming down, we've come to the tea house and from here on in, it's a long, flat walk to the monastery of Milarepa, where I'll spend the night. So, what a day. And so friends, that's about the end of our story. From the tea house, I followed the path down the valley that you see here. I stayed on that path for about two hours before arriving at a guest house where I spent the night. The next morning, I continued my journey out of the valley and then turned right. An hour or so later, I looked back to where I had just come and then turned around to see Darchin in the distance. After another hour or so, I was taking a hot shower in Darchin. There's just one more thing. On that last morning, I saw something that I thought was very remarkable. On the path out, there are these magnificent collections of Mani stones where they write Om Mani Padme Hum, the great sacred mantra of Tibet. And here we have a man who's doing full prostrations all the way around Mount Kailash, prostrating himself fully down, noting where his hands are, then walking up to where his hands touched and prostrating again. It takes about two weeks, I've been told, to prostrate around Mount Kailash. So this gentleman, to me, is, is one of the uh, spiritual heroes. as he silently prostrates around the sacred mountain.